Hello class, let us talk about the Mahayana tradition. So in this presentation, we will discuss the diverse tradition of Mahayana Buddhism. And as you may recall, in our last presentation, we learned that Theravada and Mahayana Buddhists agree on most of the foundational tenets of Buddhism. However, they disagree on three main issues, the nature of Buddha, the nature of the religious life, and Buddhist meditation practices. And also in our previous presentation, we went over the following chart. So just as a reminder, Theravada Buddhists argue that Buddha was an ordinary human being, whereas Mahayanas argue that Buddha is a supernatural being. Theravada Buddhists believe that the path of the Arhat leads to salvation, whereas Mahayanas believe that it is the path of the Bodhisattva. And whereas Theravada Buddhists adopt meditation practices like Samatha and Vipassana, Mahayanas adopt meditation practices like emptiness and sudden enlightenment forms. So with this general overview in mind, let us take a closer look at the Mahayana tradition. So the Mahayana tradition argues that it is the path of the Bodhisattva that leads to salvation, not the path of the Arhat. But what distinguishes the Bodhisattva from the Arhat? Well, the major difference between them is that whereas the Arhat focuses upon his or her own nirvana, the Bodhisattva focuses upon aiding others in the attainment of nirvana. And this focus upon universal salvation for all people is a major teaching of the Mahayana tradition and really distinguishes it from the Theravada. Indeed, the word Mahayana means greater vehicle in Sanskrit, meaning that it represents a larger ship that takes more people to the farther shore, which is an expression for Nirvana. And it is the job of the Bodhisattva to provide this universal salvation to the masses. And this act of aiding others in the pursuit of Nirvana is called compassion. And compassion is the Buddhist concept to selflessly dedicate one's life to aiding other suffering beings. And we came across this concept of kind of selfless labor or selfless acts when we discussed seva in the Hinduism unit. And to be selfless in this respect means to do something without thought of reward or the attainment of nirvana. So you're just doing something out of pure compassion. And the logic of this is that when you practice compassion, a bodhisattva empties him or herself of selfishness and desire. So again, they are selflessly coming to the aid of another person. They are not thinking of themselves and therefore they are emptying, emptying themselves rather of selfishness. Now to effectively practice compassion, a bodhisattva uses what is called skillful means which refers to using creative and often deceptive methods to help suffering beings overcome ignorance and thus attain nirvana. And an example of skillful means comes from uh, a Mahayana Sutra called the Vimalakirti Nirdesa Sutra. And in this account, the sage of Vimalakirti fakes a life-threatening illness to lure concerned villagers into his house so to teach them of the impermanence of the body. So basically news spreads that he is uh, mortally ill. They come to his house. He shows them his kind of disgusting ill body and basically uses his own body as a teaching tool to basically say, hey, the body is impermanent. The body's kind of disgusting. So become non-attached to it. So he uses this skillful mean because he's not really sick to kind of deceive people into learning some kind of Buddhist truth. Now, the use of skillful means is actually debated as an ethical issue within Buddhism. And the main question that is asked is the following dilemma. Is it ever ethical to deceive someone for the purpose of aiding that individual? Something to think about. Now, for a bodhisattva to aid others in the attainment of nirvana, he or she must possess Buddhist wisdom. That is, if one is to teach wisdom, one first needs to have wisdom. 
So to acquire such wisdom, like the Arhat, the Bodhisattva must study the teachings of Buddha as well as practice meditation. So what kinds of meditation are practiced by the Bodhisattva? So meditation practices in the Mahayana tradition are quite numerous, just as is the case with Theravada Buddhism. So we will concentrate upon two forms, what we might call emptiness meditation and sudden enlightenment meditation. So the goal of emptiness meditation is to become one with emptiness. Now, what in the world is emptiness? So a general definition of emptiness is that it refers to the impermanent nature of things. That is, everything in this world is empty of permanence. So when we, for example, unravel an apple or unravel a tree or human beings or cars, we come to the realization that all things are essentially nothing or empty. So if you unravel an apple, there's not some kind of like a soul that exists that you can see. What you basically encounter when you unravel an apple is nothing, that it has no core, it has no essence. Now, even the human mind, according to um, Mahayana Buddhist philosophers, is empty. So when we experience our first birth, that is when we're born for the first time in this world, the mind is empty. It's empty of thoughts and feelings, and it is pure, like a jewel. But over the course of many lifetimes, the mind, this jewel, becomes defiled or dirty, um, defiled with thoughts of anger, frustration, sadness, etc. So the goal of emptiness meditation, again, is to return the mind to a state of emptiness or purity. And one does this by meditating upon emptiness, meaning we must concentrate upon nothing. And when we concentrate upon nothingness, the mind becomes empty and pure, and the jewel is polished. Now, another popular form of Mahayana Buddhist meditation is called Sudden Enlightenment Meditation. And this form of meditation was created by the Chan School in China, and was later an, adopted and refined by Zen Buddhists in Japan. And according to these traditions, enlightenment can only be experienced suddenly through mindfulness meditation practices, activities such as Zazen or sitting meditation, painting, and playing music, dancing, practicing martial arts, etc. That is, the whole idea behind sudden enlightenment meditation is that when you practice mindfulness or full awareness of like your body and your mind, etc., your mind becomes empty and your mind becomes ripe to achieve enlightenment in the moment. So, for example, if you've ever walked on a balance beam, you know that you need to be mindful. That is, you need to be fully aware of your body, the balance beam, the room, the floor, the sounds, etc. And when you are in this mindful state, your mind becomes empty of everything else. You're not thinking about your bills. You're not thinking about, you know, your children, your boyfriend, your girlfriend at all. Your mind is so focused that it becomes empty because you're really concentrating upon the task in the moment. So when our mind is in this state of deep concentration, we have what Mahayana Buddhists call an emptiness experience, in which we catch a glimpse of enlightenment. So if you dedicate your life to these mindfulness meditation activities, one day you may have an intense experience in which you suddenly achieve enlightenment. Now, one way of achieving um, sudden enlightenment is through the use of koan. So Zen Buddhists, use these koans by which to attain sudden enlightenment. And koans refer to riddles that are designed to aid Zen Buddhists in attaining enlightenment. And once a Zen monk hears a koan recited, it results in a sudden blanking of the mind, which is referred to as satori, or emptiness experience. So one of the example of a koan is, you have heard the sound of the clapping of two hands, but what is the sound of one hand clapping? And another is, can you walk through a gateless gate? 
So the idea is that when you hear these paradoxical statements, many of us will draw a blank. You know, what does it mean to walk through a gateless gate? So drawing a blank in our culture is often interpreted as confusion, like I'm confused, I don't know what to think. But for Zen Buddhists, when you draw a blank, this is could can be considered a glimpse of enlightenment, that your mind has become suddenly empty. So, so far in this presentation, we have talked about Mahayana attitudes on the religious life. We have talked about Mahayana methods of meditation. So the last thing that we will discuss in this presentation is uh, the Mahayana attitude regarding the nature of Buddha. So remember, according to the Theravada tradition, Buddha was just an ordinary man with extraordinary insight. But many Mahayana sects argue that Buddha is a supernatural bodhisattva who returns to the world in human or celestial form to aid all sentient beings in their salvation. Indeed, according to the Jing Tu, or Pure Land tradition, Buddha exists in the heavenly Pure Land, surrounded by celestial bodhisattva, all of whom aid sentient beings in the attainment of nirvana. And the name of this Buddha of the Pure Land is Amitabha Buddha, the Buddha of infinite light. And Amitabha is accompanied by several other celestial bodhisattvas, such as Avalokitesvara, and the kind of feminine incarnation of Avalokitesvara, Guan Yin, and Manjusri, who is considered to be the slaying of ignorance, right? Who slays ignorance with his sword. And in Pure Land Buddhism, practitioners pray to these bodhisattva for assistance in this lifetime. And if practitioners have faith in Amitabha, Upon death, they will be transported to the Pure Land, where they can concentrate upon their attainment of Nirvana.